Hi, good day everyone. Welcome to Microbiology Class, Session 2. The image shows the structure of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. All cells have much in common and contain many of the same components. All cells have a permeability barrier called the cytoplasmic membrane that separates the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm, from the outside. Ribosomes are the structures responsible for protein synthesis and are found in all cells. Some cells have a cell wall that lends structural strength to a cell. The domain bacteria has prokaryotic cells which has lesser organelles than eukaryotic cells. The DNA genome, which is a complement of all genes in a cell, a gene is a segment of DNA that encodes a protein or an RNA molecule. The genome is a living blueprint of an organism. The characteristics, activities, and very survival of a cell are governed by its genome. The chromosome aggregates within the prokaryotic cell to form the nucleoid, a mass visible in the electron microscope. Most prokaryotic cells have only a single chromosome, but many also contain one or more small circles of DNA distinct from that of the chromosome called plasmids. Plasmids typically contain genes that are not essential and confer some special property on the cell. The genomes of bacteria and archaea are typically small and compact, and most contain between 500 and 10,000 genes, encoded by 0.5 to 10 million base pairs. Eukaryotic cells typically have much larger and much less compact genomes than prokaryotic cells. A human cell, for example, contains approximately 3 billion base pairs, which encode about 20,000 to 25,000 genes. All cells show some form of metabolism by taking up nutrients from the environment and transforming them into new cell materials and waste products. Transcription is a process by which the information on DNA is copied into an RNA molecule. And translation is the process whereby the information on an RNA molecule is used by a ribosome to synthesize a protein. Ultimately, microbial growth requires replication of the genome through the process of DNA replication, followed by cell division. All cells carry out the processes of transcription, translation, and DNA replication. Microorganisms have the ability to sense and respond to changes in their local environment. Many microbial cells are capable of motility, typically by self-propulsion. Motility allows cells to relocate in response to environmental conditions. Some microbial cells undergo differentiation, which may result in the formation of modified cells specialized for growth, dispersal, or survival. Cells respond to chemical signals in their environment, including those produced by other cells of either the same or different species, and these signals often trigger new cellular activities. Microbial cells thus exhibit intercellular communication. They are aware of their neighbors and can respond accordingly. Many prokaryotic cells can also exchange genes with neighboring cells, either of the same species or of different species, in the process of horizontal gene transfer. The indiscriminate use of antibiotics in human and veterinary medicine has selected for the proliferation of antibiotic resistance in pathogenic bacteria. The rapid pace of microbial evolution can be attributed in the part to the ability of microorganisms to grow very quickly and to acquire new genes through the process of horizontal gene transfer. The impact of microorganisms on human society. Microorganisms as agents of diseases. At the beginning of the 20th century, the major causes of human death were infectious diseases caused by bacterial and viral pathogens. In those days, children and the aged in particular succumbed in large numbers to microbial diseases. 
Today, however, infectious diseases are much less deadly, at least in developed countries. Control of infectious disease has come from a combination of advances, including our increased understanding of disease processes, improved sanitary and public health practices, active vaccine campaigns, and the widespread use of antimicrobial agents such as antibiotics. Microorganisms, Agriculture, and Human Nutrition Agriculture benefits from the cycling of key plant nutrients by microorganisms. For example, legumes are a diverse family of plants that include major crop species such as beans, peas, and lentils, among others. Legumes live in close association with bacteria that form structures called nodules on their roots. In the nodules, these bacteria convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia through the process of nitrogen fixation. Ni um, ammonia is the major nutrient found in fertilizer and is used as a nitrogen source for plant growth. Also of major agricultural importance are microorganisms that inhabit the rumen of ruminant animals such as cattle and sheep. The rumen is a microbial ecosystem in which microbial communities digest and ferment the polysaccharide cellulose, which is found in plants. Microorganisms and food. Microbes are intimately associated with the foods we eat. Microbial growth in food can cause food spoilage and foodborne disease. While some microbes can cause foodborne disease and food spoilage, not all microorganisms in foods are harmful. Indeed, beneficial microbes have been used for thousands of years to improve food safety and to preserve foods. For example, cheeses, yogurt, and buttermilk are all produced by the microbial fermentation of dairy products to produce acids. Microbial fermentations are used to produce a variety of foods, including kimchi, pickles, and certain sausages. Even the production of chocolate and coffee rely on microbial fermentation. Moreover, baked goods and alcoholic beverages rely on the fermentative activities of yeast. Microorganisms can also be used to produce biofuels. For example, natural gas methane is a product of the anaerobic metabolism of a group of archaea called methanogens. Microbes can also be used to clean up industrial pollution in a process called bioremediation. In bioremediation, microorganisms are used to transform spilled oil, solvents, pesticides, heavy metals, and other environmentally toxic pollutants. Now, you have learned the positive and negative impacts of microbes in human society. For the next topic, we will be dealing with the discovery of bacteria. Light microscopy. The English mathematician and natural historian Robert Hooke was an excellent microscopist. In his famous book Micrographia, the first book devoted to microscopic observations, he illustrated many microscopic images, including the fruiting structures of molds as seen in the picture. This was the first known description of microorganisms. The first person to see bacteria, the smallest microbial cells, was a Dutch draper and amateur microscopist Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. He constructed extremely simple microscopes containing a single lens to examine various natural substances for microorganisms. These microscopes were crude by today's standards. The picture shows a microscope and its parts. When you turn on the power switch of a microscope, a light from an illuminating source below the lens system will pass through an opening in the center of a fixed platform called stage. The light source is positioned in the base of an instrument. Some microscopes are equipped with a built-in light source to provide direct illumination. One component, called condenser, it is found directly under the stage and contains two sets of lenses that collect and concentrate light 
as it passes upward from the light source into the lens system. The condenser is equipped with an iris diaphragm, which is a shutter controlled by a lever that is used to regulate the amount of light entering the lens system. Above the stage and attached to the arm of the microscope is the body tube. This structure houses the lens system that magnifies the specimen. The upper end of the tube contains the ocular or eyepiece lens. The lower portion consists of a movable nose piece which contains the objective lenses. Rotation of the nose piece positions the objectives above the stage opening. The body tube may be raised or lowered with the aid of the coarse adjustment knob and the fine adjustment knob, which are located above or below the stage, depending on the type and make of the instrument. Let us take a look on how microbes move. Flagella, archaea, and swimming motility. Many microbial cells can move under their own power. Motility allows cells to reach different parts of their environment. And in nature, a new location may offer additional resources for a cell and spell the difference between life and death. We examine here the two major types of prokaryotic cell movement, swimming and gliding. Many bacteria are motile by swimming due to a structure called the flagellum. An analogous structure called the archaeum is present in many archaea. Flagella and archaea are tiny rotating machines that function to push or pull the cell through a liquid. As seen in the picture, in A, it is a single polar flagellum, and B, a peritrichus flagella. Flagella can be anchored to a cell in different locations. In polar flagellation, the flagella are attached at one end or both ends of a cell. Occasionally, a group of flagella may arise at one end of the cell, a type of polar flagellation which is called lophotrichus. Tufts of flagella can sometimes be seen in large and stained cells by dark field or phase contrast microscopy. When a tuft of flagella emerge from both poles of the cell, flagellation is called amphitrichus. In peritrichus flagellation, flagella are inserted around the cell surface. As in bacteria, swimming motility is widespread among species of archaea due to rotation of their flagella analog, the archaeum. These structures are roughly half the diameter of flagella, measuring about 10 to 13 nanometers in width, and impart movement to the cell by rotating, as do flagella. Gliding motility is widely distributed among bacteria, but has been well studied in only a few groups. The gliding movement itself, up to 10 micrometers per second in some gliding bacteria, is considerably slower than propulsion by flagella, but still offers the cell a means of moving about its habitat. Gliding bacteria are typically filamentous or rod-shaped in morphology, and the gliding process requires that the cells be in contact with the solid surface. Just like in the picture, which shows an oscillatoria bacteria gliding on an agar surface. That's the end of our slide. I hope you learned something. Stay safe and God bless. I hope to see you in our next session. Bye.